watch and make it break it break it break it what's up guys and thank you for tuning in to the next episode of pave the way uh, today we are privileged to interview my brother brandon wheeling uh, Brandon actually played football at the University of Georgia. He tells his story about walking on there and uh, actually coached in the SEC for several years. So we get to hear some insight from coaches and just a lot of um, talk about success and what you know leads to success. So, so excited to interview him. Uh, obviously, I, I know him pretty well, so I'm excited for you guys to get to know him a little bit and hear his story. Um, so without further ado, Brandon Whelan. All right, guys. Thank you all for tuning in uh, to our fifth episode. Um, I've got the pleasure to have my brother, Brandon Wheeling, on the show today. Uh, my brother, Brandon, he is uh, he actually played football at the University of Georgia, ended up coaching at Georgia, had a little time at Auburn, coached at Auburn. Uh, that was hard on the family, but we, we pushed through that. Um, and then he, now he's taken that into the business world, and he now works for a company called Pacer ETFs. Mm -hmm where he's somewhat of a financial advisor and uh, deals with financial advisors uh, on the regular. And uh, really just, he uh, inspires me. He's inspired me my whole life. His story is truly awesome. Um, we're gonna dive into how he ended up at Georgia and uh, how he ended up at Auburn. And it's really just really just good stuff that I want everybody to know about. So uh, thank you, Brandon, so much for coming on, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. I would have never thought even 15 years ago, you ever say anything I did that inspired you at all? It just seemed like you wanted to, to just trip me or something I was like as I was walking by. I was the you know, annoying little year, brother, but. That was definitely kind of the uh, atmosphere going up. It was always fun. Uh, I don't think Dad would have had it any other way. It was no. always fun. It was always competitive. Competitive. That's um, the word. 100%. But so the, the fact that you said inspire, I need to write. Well, at least we'll record yeah, it right now. So it's, we don't, I don't even have to write it down. We've got so it we recorded. Got it exactly. In, so. But it's true. I mean, uh, honestly, I had big shoes to fill. Literally, he's a big guy. And I was five years younger than him. And, you know, growing up, he was, we, sports was our life, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, competitive, that would, that would be a good word. He, uh, I ended up getting good at shooting threes because if I didn't shoot a three, he would just, you know, swat it with no, no, uh, he was ruthless. I, I, was, I wasn't going to give you anything. I was going to make sure you earned everything you got. You I did. Thought, yeah. I think the fact that dad was that way with me, I just kind of carried over. Oh, yeah. Just rolled downhill. So. But you did inspire me, man. You really did. But uh, tell, I guess, the world, I know your story so well, but mm -hmm. tell, Tell us from you know the early beginnings. Tell us what you would like to share with us on your story. Yeah, well, when you think it's like a story standpoint, I feel like it's just it's it's still being written. There's yeah. so much that I want to do, but one of the cool things about my life, I feel like um, I've got to live a dream maybe five or six times now, and it just the dreams just keep getting bigger and keep changing. Uh, when I was w real young, uh, Dad used to take me to watch Paulding County play football, and you know some people like to spectate and watch. I like to be in it and yeah. doing it and just from that point like i remember like sitting in the stands watching them play i like oh i want to do that yeah you know and I, so i dreamt about that and i made that a goal of mine um so much so that you know, mom tried to help me be realistic but when i was in ninth grade going into ninth grade i was the only freshman that made the summer workouts kind of going into that like there's a certain amount that you had to do to kind of qualify to go to varsity camp i was the only freshman that did that and mom just trying to help me kind of like prepare. She's like, well, why is a coach going to play a ninth grader over a senior? Well, I didn't start in ninth grade, but I kept pushing it and I got to play a decent amount. And then turn around my sophomore year, you know, I was able to start and I had a, just a phenomenal time living that first dream. Yeah. Um, and that year y'all went to the final four, right? Yeah, we went to the Georgia Dome. Um, and I think it was the first time anyone from Paulding County had, had ever done that. Wow. Nice. Um, so that was really cool. And, you know, we still, the, the, uh, the team that I, I was on, like that went all the way through, we were the winningest class in the history of Pawnee County High School. Yeah. So that was just a really cool experience just to, to go and, uh, and be a part of. But, you know, that was one dream. You know, your dreams have to continue to grow because if, if that would have been my one dream, you know, what would I, what would I do for the rest of my life? You'd I, still be at those yeah, games, yeah, live, you know, living the glory days. Well, I, I couldn't play high school football any longer after I was 17. That's true. You yeah. know, but so I, um, so that was, that was and interesting. That was coming up on 20 years ago. That's wild. That, that blows my mind. Yeah, that's wild. So if I, if I were living that same dream today that I was living 20 years ago, you know, I mean, yeah. what kind of life is that? That's you know? right. So for, for me, uh, the dreams just got bigger. Um, you know, I really, truly growing up, 
always loved the Georgia Bulldogs. I mean, I think that's just part of growing up in in Georgia and always wanted to be a Bulldog. Well, I you know, I didn't know what that process looked like coming out of school. Um, and so I, part of it, I, I basically had to take the long way around to make that happen. So I, I dreamt of playing college football, and it started for me at West Georgia. Um, I, and I, I actually walked on there and, uh, and played, played at West Georgia for a couple of years, and I was able to, to earn a scholarship. Um, I was able to get to play and, 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 and do some things there, and I, I was a two-year starter um, at the end of my sophomore year. Well, at that point, I had enough credit hours and a high enough GPA that I got accepted into UGA. Yeah. So it was like, all right, boom, I've always dreamt about going to Georgia, but now that's an opportunity. But like with that opportunity, I had to leave some security behind. Yeah. I had a scholarship at Georgia, or at West Georgia, rather. Um, and then I had to kind of roll the dice just to even see if I could go make the team at West Georgia, at, at, at UGA. So from there, um, that's a big gamble. Well, I mean, it, it just depends on how you look at it. Yeah. You know, it, w- would I regret not going more than I would losing a scholarship at West Georgia? So that's kind of the thing I was trying to balance. I feel like in life you have the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Yeah. Um, and I, I would much rather choose the pain of discipline rather than live with the regret. Um, you know, so for me, like the fact that when, the minute I got accepted, like it wasn't even a question. This is what I was going to do. And I, you know, again, um, you know, just you have your, your your friends that care about you. It's like, man, Brandon, like, you know, like, what if you don't make it? You yeah. know, what if it doesn't work out? You're walking away from a scholarship. Yeah, and yeah. You, and you have friends that generally care care about you and want you to make good decisions that want um, you uh, not to be kind of left out in the cold, if you will. But sometimes. I feel like, and from some of your previous shows, I've already heard y'all talk about, you know, like dream crushers. Yeah. If somebody's dream isn't as big as yours, it's going to be really hard for them to understand, you know, what you're going through. Now, yeah. a part of a dream is there's always a price yeah. to that. Yeah. So I had to go in and like truly, they weren't, I wasn't going in. I had nothing guaranteed mm-hmm. when I got to Georgia. I, I had to go, one, I had to go earn my right to even be on the team. And for a lot of folks, you know, that's a lot of people's dreams, you know. Like there just was, to be on the team. Yeah, just, just yeah. to be on the team. There were several guys that are phenomenal guys that work their tail off. But once they be, they were on the team at this point, you know, you, you talk a lot about work on mentality. A, a, a lot of folks are, you know, walk-ons are some of the hardest working people you'll ever meet in your life. But a lot of those guys that I saw would get to that point. They made the team. They've accomplished their goal. Mm-hmm. They don't continue to look forward to the next goal. Yeah. So now, like, all right, I've, I've, I've achieved it. I'm on the team. Well, for me, I didn't want to just be on the team. I mentioned earlier, I, I, I'm not a very good spectator. Yeah. I, I like to be in the thick of it as much as I can. And then I was very fortunate when I got to Georgia, there were a handful of D linemen that were beat up. So that spring, we go through mad drills. I get invited to actually spring practice. It's kind of like, the, you know, they kind of whittle you down as you go. Well, spring practice, I'm rolling with the twos. I, mm-hmm. I haven't even had, I haven't even seen a playbook yet. <laughs> I mean, so I like, all right, and I just got my, my position coach who I, I ended up spending 10 years professionally. Uh, after I played with him at Georgia, I spent the better part of the next decade working with him coaching football. Nice. Um, but he's literally behind me, or like behind the offensive line. Telling me what to do, like whenever they call a play in, but you know, it just it's just what it was. But I, all right, so here I am, and you, you kind of have uh, an opportunity at that point. You can go in there and just make a fool of yourself, or you can go in there Step and, and really get after it yeah. and, and, and Rise just compete. To the like, sometimes when you don't know what you do, if you just go hard, that's right, yeah. and do the best you can, yeah, you know, things might work out well for you. That's right. You know, if you just go give it a shot. So, um, kind of fast forward. I had to sit out because of the transfer rules. We didn't have a portal at that point. You know? <laughs> That's unfortunate, uh, yeah. by the way. I think about that. I know, because I would have uh, really played a lot in that 2008 season. And then, I, so I basically had to forego my junior year. And then I got to play in 10 of the 12 games my senior year and earned a scholarship. Yeah. And, um, and, and truly, that was, I, I guess if you'll say, that was the, kind of the second dream yeah. that, I, I, that I got to live. Because you, if I remember correctly, you were like awarded walk-on of the year, right? Wasn't there like yeah, some so sort of award? Yeah, so like in the spring, yeah, I, I, won, I, I won that award. Um, How many walk-ons per year? 
Um, so basically, the way the scholarship um, the way the scholarship limit works um, you, you, for football, um, and a lot of it's all kind of tied to Title IX. Um, you, you can only have 125 football players. Okay. There's 85 scholarships. I think, or 88, I think, 88 scholarships, and then there, then there's, you know, the rest of the team is made up of walk-ons. Um, and so I, everybody always talks about like paying players and athletes and things like that. I was on the team with No Sean, uh, uh, Moreno, and Matthew Stafford, uh, and then you know talking about paying players and making things fair. They were like kind of one and, and two, you know, from a performance standpoint. And like as a, I was the 88th person on scholarship, so <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't make the pay kind of like equal out there. So you, yeah, that's where socialism, you know, just uh, it doesn't work. Even, yeah. even in, in that regard. So what I could that's get for point. what I could get for an autograph, and what Matt Stafford could get for an autograph then and now, a little there's bit a completely huge different. <laughs> so, uh, and on to make you backtrack, but uh, you, you're transferring into UGA, but. How did you even get in touch? You just email Mark Rick and say, what's up? Well, and so um, Mike Bobo recruited this area um, when I was in high school and never really had a conversation with Mike when I was in high school playing. But like I saw him and I don't, I'm, I think they were probably when they were recruiting Paul Duncan, Duncan at East Baldwin because mm. Paul, I went to Notre Dame and had a phenomenal career there. Uh, but I think they probably just kind of like courtesy stopped by <laughs> Paulding County. Even though when I was in school, we never lost to East Paulding. Shameless plug there to the Patriots. Um, but I just happened to pass Mike Bobo as I was kind of walking from uh, weight training up to class and had a, just a, cool. a five minute conversation. He gave me his card and said, if I ever get into school, he would get it set up where I could walk on. Dude, that's amazing. So I kind of had to live up to my end of the bargain there. Yeah. I had to go do what I had to do to get in school. So two years later, he got a phone call from me and put me in contact with Coach Tereshinsky, who ran the walk-on program. And that, um, man, what a story! How the, how the process it was that in the back of your mind the entire time you're playing football at West Georgia? No, it was. It, was, it wasn't even in the back of my mind. Oh, it was. It was in front of my. It mind. was the that, goal. That was that what was I was the goal. focused. That was the dream at the time, like um, you mentioned. And I was, you know, I was training at West Georgia like I was preparing to play at Georgia. Hmm. And there is so much to be said about that. Mm -hmm. So I just, I was really focused on that next step. You know, and for me, and sometimes I almost kind of kick myself because I, I say, you, I, truly, you can't outgrow, you can't, you'll never outgrow your dreams. My dream was to play football at Georgia, and I, I lived that. But then I, I got to that point, I, I was on scholarship, I was playing, I wanted to play the best that I could. That's really where my dream stopped. I never dreamt about playing in the NFL. Yeah. My dream was just, I wanted to play at Georgia. And for whatever reason, I, I, I want to say I set a limiting belief because – I felt like I could compete with everybody, but I just didn't strive for that. Yeah. I didn't even work out and train for pro day. Yeah. And you could have really. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you know, I, I had pro teams interested, you know, wanting to know if I would be interested in like signing as a free agent and kind of going that route. Um, but really my next dream, I wanted to coach. Yeah. And so that's where that next focus went. So when I was playing at Georgia, I was dreaming about someday coaching okay. at Georgia. And so that's kind of where the next step was. So just always kind of having a dream out in front of you. That's that powerful, you're, man. That you're, you're, that you're chasing. And so, and, and that was really the next step. Um, staffs are huge now, but when I graduated, you had basically two grad assistants. And then anybody else who was willing and maybe naive enough, I'll say, I don't want to, I don't want to be rude cause, and talk bad about myself, but naive enough to go work for free. <laughs> And that's initially what I did. I, mean, uh, like, I went and worked for free. Um, and I, I literally, I worked for peanuts. And I, I say that literally because we would get these huge boxes of Georgia peanuts that we would get delivered every two weeks. <laughs> and that's they would just on. they would just drop them in our office. And so, man, I, I fell in love with Georgia peanuts uh, back then. And you know, that, that love relationship has been great for me over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you get done playing mm -hmm. and you immediately go and start working within the program i went to i coached high school football for a year that's right in south and carolina right went to south carolina and then i got a job at kennesaw mountain and this was circa 2008 2009 mm -hmm. uh and then my job at kennesaw mountain got cut almost like a month after i took the job and it was kind of like a mid-year transition but the, the budget was pretty tight so cobb county kind of first in first out on the teacher standpoint so they laid off a lot of the teachers that year oh wow so i was kind of sitting there well, my dream is to coach college football. That was kind of the dream. 
So I'm like, well, I don't have kids yet. I'm young. I don't have any expenses. Let me go give this a shot. So I enrolled uh, in graduate school because you had to be technically a student to, to volunteer and, and to actually be able to coach. So I did that um, and, and basically kind of paid my paid paid myself to go work or I paid for them to let me work. Yeah. You um, had to pay for tuition and mm, then you got to coach. Yeah. <laughs> for peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's what we did. And um, that's the dream though, man, like mm -hmm. being committed to your dream. We always ask the question to our guys, are you committed? Or are you interested? Mm -hmm. And you were committed to that goal. You weren't yeah. just interested to yeah. each goal as yeah, each one each, surfaced. Yeah, yeah. That's the coolest part of that, of getting that, like, are you truly committed to your goals or are you just interested? Because so many people in life have so many goals per se, mm -hmm. but they're just stuff that they write down in yeah. their, their journal. They have goals, not... but you don't see them working on them. Exactly. Oh, you have a goal to get in shape. Why did I never see you at the gym for the past two years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's, just, it's just words. Um, I worked for Will Muschamp for a year and <laughs> we didn't sleep at all that year. So you could probably almost equate it to three. <laughs> but Will used to always say, your actions speak so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, gosh. That's heat. That's so I, I, that's good. good. I mean, and it's not me, so it's 100% Will Muschamp. But, yeah. I mean, it, like, he would, we'll get him on the show later. Yeah. Later. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that was one of the, one of the, and there's so many takeaways, in, but that was like from working from Will, um, you know, just from an accountability standpoint, you can talk the talk all day long, but your actions have to match up with what you're saying you want to do. I that's love so that. Good. Yeah. That's so good. So, how long was it that you were, because I remember that phase of your life. I, mm -hmm. I really do remember it where I was even like, man, is he crazy? Like he's just going out there and, you know, but I always knew that you rise to the occasion. So I knew that something was going to work out. I never imagined that it would work out the way it did. So how long did you have to grind for free before? Because mm -hmm. didn't you go to a graduate assistant after that? Yeah. So I, I did that first year um, and then. They basically, it's almost like a limited earnings. I don't know how that whole thing breaks down, but like there was like a, almost like a paid position, but you, you literally, you, you could only make so much money. I'm like, I don't know what, what yeah. kind of world that, that was, but um, so I went from making nothing to making, my take home was right around 800 bucks a month. Nice. So yeah, that Better was peanuts, actually, yeah, no doubt. And my rent was 300 bucks a month. So I was like, I was living large. I had an extra 500 bucks <laughs> in my pocket. So that was, and you know, the crazy thing for me as I'm doing this at this point, I'm like 25 years old. Yeah. Hmm. All my buddies from college went and they're working in Atlanta, you know, they're making really good money and I'm, you know, I'm just like, at this point, I'm just trying to figure out a way to survive, Yeah. you know, but I didn't have any expenses, uh, you know, outside of just needing food. Um, so we, we were just trying to make the most of it. So I, and I was just trying to work hard. I was trying to be a sponge um, and, and just learn as much as I could. Well, circle or just kind of fast forward. We had two really good years, 2011 and 2012 um, were two, some of the best years. We In 2012, we literally, that was a year in the SEC championship that Chris Connolly, another Georgia or Paulding County uh, boy, yeah. I uh, got tackled. The, the ball was deflected. He, he caught it and got tackled on the five yard line uh, in that SEC championship game. I cried. I yeah. cried. And then Alabama went on to beat Notre Dame pretty handily like in, 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 that, in that national championship game. Yep, that was basically the national championship. I mean, in, in, in the lot, SEC championship. In, that in year. a lot of ways. And you can say that most years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's true. Yeah. So we um, came up just short there. And then, so my position coach, Ronnie Garner, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he had played for Coach Dye at Auburn. And when Coach Malzahn got hired at the end of the 2012 season in 2013, he was trying to get as many Auburn men kind of cut back in the fold yeah. cloth to be a part of the program. Yeah. And so Rodney was gracious enough to, to, to let me tag along with him. And I go on to spend five years at Auburn. Um, so Georgia folks don't, don't hate me there. <laughs> and, uh, prayer Jordan Hare. <laughs> um, I was coaching up D4, who I think sacked Aaron Murray two times yeah. in that game. So that was that was a pretty interesting experience. Um, that had to be interesting going yeah. from your dream of Georgia, you mm -hmm. playing for Georgia, and now, you know, Auburn's one of our top – it used to be. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, it used to be. Still, now we just you, wax them. But, uh, well, you, you can't know. say that. The Deep South's the oldest rivalry. I mean, it really is. It's yeah. a big rivalry. I mean, yeah. I consider them in Florida, and those are two of our bigger rivalries. Mm -hmm. So oh. that had to be – 
you know, interesting for you to go yeah. to go do that. I, is, go ahead, I always sorry. wonder about that because it's yeah. like when Kirby Smart coaches Alabama, is there like a part of him that didn't want to win? Like I doubt that because he's a winner. It, but, it's, you know, it's, it's competition. And what's it like? Truly, like your heart, your, your investment is in that team that in you're players, a part of right yeah. now. So yeah. it's like, yes, I was, I was a part. I played on the 2009 Georgia team. You know, that was my last year at Georgia. So, like, I was fully invested in that team winning. But then you get fully invested in the team that you're coaching right now. And it's yeah. like, you, you know, you're not going to be self-sabotaging. So, it's just it's just different. Like, as you take a step back, while I was at Auburn, I always wanted Georgia to do well, it, sure. unless they were competing against us. I think the world of Mark Rick, I always wanted Coach Rick to be successful. Oh, yeah. And I wanted him to do well. And, and now, as I kind of take a step back, it's, it's all about people. Yeah. You know, like right now, obviously, I'm, I'm really excited for the success Kirby's had at Georgia. Yeah. But it's like the people that I root for are the people that played for me and the people that I coach with. That makes sense. You know, so you, it ends up just becoming about relationships there. So, I mean, 100%, I, I do have like a Georgia National Championship flag in my yard. I'm 100% love the dog. Oh, yeah, still a dog. But, I mean, I met so many phenomenal people at Auburn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, and I cherish those relationships. And I'll, and I'll always, 100% of the time, root for Auburn when they're not playing at all. And I'm the same way now, you know, because we uh, – I've been very fortunate in my life to have him as a brother, not only with all the stuff we talked about inspiring, but I got tickets to a lot of these big time <laughs> games. So me and my dad got to tag along for, you know, we were at the SEC Championship – I was actually, um, we'll dive into this a little bit more, but in his journey um, with Auburn, we got to go to the uh, kick six game. And I'm a diehard Georgia fan wearing Auburn stuff because he gave it to me for free. So I'd wear it to the games because we were sitting in the family section. But when that dude, when Chris, Chris Davis, Davis ran that kick back, I rushed the field and was picking up Auburn fans and joy right. jumping. Like don't even like Auburn really, but I'm, that game was so crazy. I rushed the field, jumped over the hedges, and was like out there just running crazy. As probably a, mm -hmm. everybody probably thought I was a big time Auburn fan because yeah. that was just a crazy game. Yeah, and you were probably game. so happy for your brother, man. It was, there and that's what it, you know. Like he said earlier, the relationships. I always wanted my brother to find success. When they played Georgia, it was always hard, but deep down, yeah. I wanted my brother to win. Like yeah. right? you know, because the relationship. Mm -hmm. So from your journey at Auburn, because you go to you go to Auburn. And y'all start having some success. I mean, y'all 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 end up losing to wasn't uh, it was the crab legs guy that y'all lost to, wasn't it? Uh, Famous Wednesday. FSU. Yeah, we lost it. We lost. Yeah, and it was 13 seconds left on the clock, and he scored. Oh, so um, devastated. It was just kind of a just like we probably basically three plays that that went wrong, you know. And, and I, you, in your mind, you kind of think there was a fake punt that we at the end of the second second quarter. That they converted a first down and ended up scoring a touchdown, you know, let them off the hook there. We were going to be up 24 to three going into halftime. It was 24 to 10. Um, and then there was, we, we score, should be a situation where we're putting the game on ice up by 14. Um, and, and on the kickoff, one of our best players pulls a hamstring, falls down, and in the gap where he would have been, they Somebody just split the same way back for a touchdown. And so it's just things like that. And then, Basically, just kind of a fluke play uh, ended up being like a 60-yard gain uh, on that final drive. Um, we, we had our, our corner kind of slip, lose his footing, got caught it, and just was off to the race. It was that big, big wide receiver. Um, that, mm -hmm. that I mean, they had a good team. They, they yeah. had a really good they team. They had a good team. They I think they were their last good team. Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> you know, and, they're and decent. Man, I think they're kind of getting back on track with Coach Mordell. But, yeah, it was a they were, I mean – that was kind of the highlight of Jimbo Fisher's era there, and it, and it started to decline. Yeah, but I remember, you know, it was kind of cool to, to see the success that y'all were having at Auburn. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, you know, I know you obviously got to work for Steele, you worked for Coach Gardner, you work, You mentioned earlier that you worked for Muschamp at Auburn. Mm -hmm. What was something that, that you saw from those coaches that led to, you know, the success there? Yeah. What is something that are coaching on that level? Because yeah. these guys are obviously successful. Yeah, I mean, you got contracts. to rub elbows with some of like the top coaches in college football. Like, yeah, I, I'm sure there was some lessons you learned there. I'll say the biggest success, and like we talk about it, and I mean, like, I know TCU had a phenomenal turnaround this year, but, you know, we just like in two, 2012, Auburn did not win an SEC football game. That's wild. And then to turn around and win the SEC championship the next year with basically the same nucleus yeah. on that team from a mm. player standpoint. 
the one thing that we were committed to every day was just get get a little bit better every day. Mm. And that was just really our thought process. And it was, you know, week to week going into it, you know, we were just like, let's find a way to win this week. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were, you know, looking to find a way. So we opened the season with Washington State. We were trying to find anything we could from a competitive advantage just to find a way to beat Washington State. You know, and then the next week we had Arkansas State. And, you know, we were as equally nervous about Arkansas State at that point because we were just trying to find a way to win. We were probably week 10 of the season kind of going into the Georgia game before we were sitting there. We were sitting there seven and one. Thinking, hey, man, we might, we might actually be pretty good. Wow. You know, and so, but we were just week to week just trying to get better. I'm trying to focus on the fundamentals and do do the little things. And I truly, even though I'm not coaching now, I have like just coaching in my DNA. I just think of Chuck Knoll, who was in dating, you know, unless you're like a true football historian, won multiple Super Bowls for the Pittsburgh Steelers back in their heyday. You know, and his whole thing, he just always talked about being uncommon at the little things. Mm. It's not really the big things that are going to set you apart. You know, if you're looking to win a championship, you might have a fluke play here or there, but it, for football, it's the guys that are the best at blocking and the best at tackling that are going to be the winners mm. and just focusing on the fundamentals. Being uh, uncommon at the good things. At the little things. At the little things. Little things. The things yeah. that matter. You I know. love that. Uh, and it's just truly just fundamentals. Like, you know, we talk about all the time in, in work now, you know, like what are the fundamentals that are going to lead to your success? I mean, like and, a phone and just, call or, or just the activity that that's a part of it, you know? Um, you guys have been asking me a lot of questions. Like I spend the majority of my time engaging, working with financial advisors and finding problems that they're challenging, challenged with for their clients and helping them solve those problems. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't just show up with my agenda, you know, or from that standpoint. So just kind of focusing on those, those details. Like for me, I need to know the capital markets from an investment standpoint. I mean, I need to be aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I need to know what their challenges that they're facing. Yeah. So that means I have to do my homework. I, so I spend I, I, every night I, I do, I have a review of what happened in, in the investment world that day. Mm. And then I spend my time throughout the day. Uh, and there's several resources, but I, I like to use Barron's. I like to use CNBC just to go and hear what's going on in, in the capital markets knowing what the challenges are for my clients. Yeah. So it just if you think about it in the business world and how that relates, you know, if I go sit down with you, hey, Brent, I know you're in real estate. Kind of, you know, what can I do to help you? If I ask you that question, now you have to pause and think about what your challenges are. Yeah. I, I'm creating work for you yeah. rather than helping you. Yeah. You know, so rather than coming in and say, Alex, you know, how's everything going with the insurance agency? You know, what can I do to help you? in that regard, I, again, I'm not being a resource to you. I'm not adding value to you. I, I hope to at some point, but I got to do my homework on the front. Yeah, like know what's yeah, going on I need in that to know world. what's going on in the industry. So like when I sit down with an advisor, I know what their firm research says. I know what the capital markets are, look, what, what they look like. I'm able to come in and have solutions for the challenges. For the problems that they have. That they have. Yeah, without you know, them even I'm, telling you. Yeah, I'm yes. able to speak their language. That's good. You know, and so that's where those fundamentals come into play now yes. in life. So and that's still the, and those, the those scheduling in the evenings, that's the little things. Mm -hmm. That's yes. the little things that that's you're getting. It. Absolutely. There's so much to be said about that's that. So, so it good. starts with the discipline from the football, and then you take it to the to each dream, mm -hmm. and then you just stay good at the little things. Yeah. What else in the – in the de what are more details that you got from the SEC that translate into business now? Yeah, well, I mean – the. I would say the biggest thing, because I mean, you spend you spend basically your your time is kind of divided. Uh, one is all on the, like on the football side. You have you know basically fifteen percent of your day, so twelve hours of your day goes into football, and then the other twelve hours of your day goes into recruiting. And you might kind of slip a nap in there here or there. Yeah, I, I really, especially now with the transfer portal and and the whole process there, I don't know how these coaches survive. Um, I don't know how they survived before, but now especially, yeah. it's crazy. But so with that, one is you, you have to be able to manage your time. Mm -hmm. you, sometimes you have hard deadlines that are coming up quick that you have to really know what that's like. Like, you know, come hell or high water, you know, you, you have practice at 2 o'clock, you know, you're going to start meeting. So everything that's happening is coming fast. you got to get it ready. you got to prioritize what's important. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then outside of that, you got to have long-term things. So like, yes, we have practice this afternoon at, at two o'clock, but then we also, we on Sunday, when we, uh, after the game, we're going to have to have the scouting report ready yeah. at two o'clock on Sunday afternoon for the next opponent. So just being able to prioritize and yeah. take time. So like, all right, boom, everything we're focused on getting everybody to practice. Then we get everything set up there. Saturday's big game, and then yeah. Sunday's the but, turnaround. And it's just, uh, it's, it's just wild. interesting. And I'll say kind of a side note: one of the coolest things about my time at Auburn is that Coach Die was on, and this is Pat Die, who's been retired from coaching since the early '90s. I think his last year he coached was 1992. Um, he was one of the first people in the building every Sunday morning, and he would watch film with Coach Garner and I. And then as other coaches would come in, he would just work his way down the hall. No way. Watching film. So you would just really get his perspective. Which Are you really serious? Cool. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, um, which is really cool. And I mean, you want to talk about just words of wisdom. I, I have a, like a little notepad at home where it just, if Coach Dye said it, I would just kind of write it down, you know, because he was around all the time. That's so cool. Um, and just so, so many, um, so many things, you know, from that, especially just, um, and, and if you're a, a business owner, you have employees. I think one of the one of my favorite takeaways from Coach Dye, he says you got to. He always would say you got to make it easy for them to be right. Make it hard for them to be wrong. So make the path of the least resistance to do the right thing. Yeah. Versus you know you know making it easy for them to do the wrong thing. Um, so That's just, good stuff. Yeah. So just little little nuggets like that you could kind of steal from him. I mean, and truly to this day. Um, you know, it just kind of rings out in my mind. You know, and I mentioned it earlier where Will Miss Champ said, you know, if your, your action speaks so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. When I'm thinking about big dreams or things like that, all right, I, I think about what those actions are going to have to be to go achieve those dreams. Yeah. So is it really a dream at that point? If I'm thinking about it, I mean, is it something I think about that would be cool? Or is it a goal that I actually want to go accomplish? Yeah. I'm going to try. Put effort yeah, towards, yeah. Put well, action actually, towards. yeah. And, and, and making a mind, too, I'm not just going to try. This is something I'm looking to go accomplish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because, in my opinion, try is a weak word. That's right. Because trying is something that I, if, if things work out, then we'll do it, you know. Um, but this is something that I'm striving to achieve versus trying That's to right. do. I think, that, I think there's... Uh, you know, two two totally different things. Well, the action regard. the action thing for me is like it's like if you just keep at it, eventually you're going to get a break. Eventually, with you coaching, if you you went there for free. Mm -hmm. If you kept at it, you got that break, and that's yeah. how it happens in my life. You know, if I keep at it, if mm -hmm. I keep chopping that wood, eventually it's going to break. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. something's going to break. And it always does. It Same always for me. Does. It was yeah. when I started in insurance. It was like, hey, if I'll just keep doing it, eventually I'll get an opportunity. And <laughs> here we are. Yeah, if here's an unwritten. Here's something you didn't even expect at all. So yeah, if you do it long enough, I mean, it's it's truly like a pinata. First time you hit it, doesn't even really phase it. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just that constant, just chipping away, chipping Definitely. away. Eventually, that really makes bus. an impact. Impact. You yeah. know, you think? Uh, I think of the movie The Shawshank Redemption. Oh, yeah. You know, he movie. had that little bitty, oh, little yeah. bitty hammer and just started kind of like he was just counting the days. You know, how long he'd been there, and then yeah, one day right. part of it came off, and then he just started kind of. From there, just chipping away a little bit at a time. Then he's getting free. Yeah, no, eventually. So, yeah, so I mean, it's just, it, it, and it's truly, it's the actions that kind of compound. That's right. Over yes. time. It's just like when you invest, it's like the compounding interest is really the compounding interest of your actions that, that make a big long term difference for sure. That's good, man. Yeah. Real quick, guys, this is Rob with the Wheeling Agency. I just wanted to reach out to y'all. We've been in business a little over three years here in Palm County. We take pride in serving our community. So next time you're in the need for some insurance, give us a call and reach out. Now get back to the show. So I know for me, um, being a diehard Georgia fan and getting to kind of go along that ride with you and go to all the games, um, you were playing under Mark Rick. And then you coached for Mark Rick for a couple years. Mm -hmm. And for me, Mark Rick is just like a, just a good dude, great coach. He did so much for the University of Georgia. But working for him, playing for him, are there any lessons or anything that really sticks out to you in your memory from, mm -hmm. from your time with him? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest quality that Coach Rick had, he truly lets his actions, like, and his, he's very principle oriented, but his actions, you know, again, are basically his testimony, if you will. And, you know, I think of the verse where it says, let your light shine before men that they see your good works and then they glorify God. I feel like Mark Rick is just truly uh, like a living, breathing example of that. Um, 
And you know, when you think about it, just in the coaching world, there's so much pressure to yeah. find a shortcut, to find you know, an angle, to cheat, to do something immoral, especially um, with, with the demands of coaching in the SEC. Yeah. He always tried to do things the right way. And the decisions he made were always in regards to – he would always – obviously, as a coach, a head coach of a football team, you had to think the best interest of your team – but then he also weighed heavily the best interest of individuals, mm-hmm. you know, and how he, he did not take that aspect of being a mentor lightly at all. Yeah. Um, and from a leadership standpoint, when you think about like a head coach, the kind of person he would want to work for, he did a phenomenal job of setting high standards and high expectations, giving you the parameters that he wanted those standards to be achieved, but then letting you go and do it. He wasn't a micromanager. Yeah. He wasn't going to sit there and nitpick every little thing you did. Like, oh, this is how I would do it. This is how you should do it here. He literally said, this is what I want. Figure it out. You're the head coach of the your defensive unit or your offensive unit. Go make it happen. Yeah. Nice. And then would give you resources to, to do that. He wanted you to be successful. He gave you the tools to be successful. But he, he did not like, overwhelm you in the process as well. So I um, – but I, I don't think we, we could have a whole 45 minute segment just talking about how good of a man that Mark Rick is. Yeah. We read his, uh, what was the devotional thing we read? It was like, take the call, make the call. Make the yeah. call. Make yeah. the call. Was, I really enjoyed that. I mean, Mark Rick for me just, you know, for me to have in the world we live in today, it's getting better, I think, somehow. But back in the day, it was hard for somebody to have faith in the workforce, work field. Workforce. Yeah, to, to have that faith and to, to uh, display his faith so openly. Mm-hmm. He did that. You know, I saw that. I saw him being a man of God. And then, obviously, I got the inside of you playing for him, and it, it was his actions lined up with what he was, with what he was preaching. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just wanted to bring up Mark Rick because I know he probably played a, a huge role in, in your success. Yeah, I mean, and you just I truly – I. I with all your coaches, you, you know, even back just along the journey of like coaching youth sports through high school, um, you, there's different lessons and different nuggets that you, you pull away. Um, and, and just the impact that Coach Rick has made in so many people's lives that, that, that he coached and folks that he, for that matter, didn't even coach. Yeah. Just the, the, the example and the testimony that is his life is, is just so incredible. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. I love that. So another question that I want to ask you is, because cool thing about you transitioning to coaching, you played with, you know, obviously you said you played with Matt Stafford, you played with Noshawn Marino, Geno Atkins was there mm-hmm. at the time. So, I mean, you yep. got, you were around greatness. AJ and then Green. You went on <laughs> to coach. Green. You went on to coach, you know, D Ford, all these guys at Auburn when y'all had that big run of y'all were turning out really good defensive linemen year mm-hmm. after year. Um, what is and, and then even for you, I would say, um, going from a walk on to a scholarship and just truly have it, your own greatness. And kind of doing it again yeah. with the graduate assistant thing. Absolutely. <laughs> but what my question is, what do you think it is? Because I mean, talent only takes people so far. Obviously, those guys were talented. Obviously, mm-hmm. Geno Atkins is talented. <laughs> but what do you think, as a coach, as a player, seeing greatness like that? What do you think is something that separates? like the talent versus the people who truly make greatness? Mm-hmm. Well, there's just a cost that has to be paid. Tom Brady, I mean, you think about Tom Brady. He was a six-round draft pick. You know, he was he had a little bit of talent. You know, you weren't going to put him at wide receiver. His talent was different. Yeah. Like, for me, I had a little bit of talent, but you weren't going to put me at quarterback. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just – understand. But then from there's, there's just a price – to greatness and it doesn't even matter what field it is in Mm-mm. yeah mm-hmm. you know if you're going to be the best realtor you know if you're going to sell the most houses there's a price that goes along with that you know, if um and for example in sports and, and the best example to me that comes to mind is 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 d ford um he took care of his body better than anybody i've ever seen in my life like the year 2013, he walked around carrying a jug of water all the time, staying hydrated. He was, you know, you, like he would be, we'd be in a team meeting, he would get checked in, and then he would be like in the pool doing his stretching routine to get ready for practice and just things Man. like that. He goes and he's a first round draft pick the next year. 
what do you think everybody on the team was walking around carrying in 2014? Mm. Mm. A big jug of water. Man. You know, so he set the tone there. But, you know, just knowing that there's a price that has to be paid. If you want to be a great athlete, you, you can be a good athlete and you can perform well. Um, and you can go out and party and live that lifestyle. Sure. You can do that. But if you're going to be elite, yeah. you got to be thinking about, all right, you know, there's an old saying, that it's hard to soar with the eagles if you hoot with the owls. Mm. So just paying that price. You yeah. know, I think, you know, J.J. Watt, and he said this when I was still playing, or when I was still coaching, rather. And I, like, this minute I saw it, I started sharing this with my, my players. Like I, like, I think he tweeted it, and then, like, I retweeted it to all my guys. Um, but he said, you know, I have my whole life to go out and party and drink beer. I only have a very short window of time to be elite in the NFL. Yeah. He's like a four-time, five-time defensive player of the year. So just kind of putting it in perspective. So talent is a huge part of it. And, and like for everybody, there's something I believe like you were created to do and that you can do extremely well. I think God made us all with an, with an intentional purpose mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a role for us to fill. But then you, you have to be willing to pay the price for that greatness, you, you know, and it really comes down to, especially if you think about it in the business world, again, it gets back to being in common, what I mentioned Chuck Noll earlier. Do you want to be, like, if, you, if you're average, you're just kind of run the mill, you know, you're just kind yeah. of in, in there, you're kind of doing your thing, um, but, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing special going on. You're, you're, you're a good guy, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're a good lady, you know, you, you do a good job, shows up, you know, he's mm. where he's supposed to be. He's going through she the does what she's supposed to do, but there's there's nothing exceptional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, the, and on the side of, it, of exceptional, it requires a higher cost. Yeah, I love know? that. So, and sometimes you'll hear people talk about, you know, like, you know, all this requires, you know, to, to do a good job is to just show up. I think to me, you're really giving somebody some bad advice. Yeah. You know, you, you hear about availability being the best ability, but... You have to show up prepared. Yeah. You have to show up and work. And so if you if you just show up and you're just there, you can punch a clock. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you can ride out and then you can if you're if you're an employee, you can really cheat your boss and not add any value there. But if you're an entrepreneur or if you're somebody who's like in, in sales like I am that gets paid and like their performance is tied to commissions and, and that's where your pay comes from. You gotta get out and work. Exactly. Amen. Yeah. And so that, you can't just show up. That price to be paid, I love that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that, that was such a good answer. Yeah. They, there's just a cost that the great ones pay. Um, you know, and, the cost and the mind, and there's a mindset that comes with paying it. We have my father-in-law on here, and he uh, one thing he always tells me, and he may have said it on the show, but he's always he always says, you know, successful people their day starts a little earlier and it ends a little later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pay work, that price. Um, and, and I'll say this too: work. Or I guess success, I'll say, follows the work. Mm -hmm. You know, if you put in the work, then you start to believe that you, you basically that you've earned it or you deserve it or you that you, I don't know if you ever really deserve anything, you know, but like you, like you, if you put in the work though, you've invested the time, you know, being successful isn't a surprise to you. Yeah. When you make more phone calls than everybody else, you should close more business. That's just kind of part of it. Um, and it, it was the same thing with those athletes. Now, there, there are some guys that were just phenomenal, freakish athletes that would do some pretty amazing things, but then they fizzled out. Yeah. Mm. And that, they were that, that was the difference. Paying the price, yeah. Yeah, that, that was truly the difference. And that's something, that, you know, I can relate to in my life because, dude, you were a hard worker, and so many people told me. And like I said earlier before we started, we're five years apart. So there was a year – between not a wheeling being at Palm County High School, when I got there, everybody knew me from your work ethic. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, you know, like the J.J. Watt, you mentioned that, of like generational players who have brothers who are generational players, who have brothers. And me and you really had a different work ethic in the high school days. Like I was more gifted athletically and didn't work out as hard, didn't really pay the price. And you did, and you took it to a next level. And when I said earlier that you inspired me, that's something that always I think about, I mean, probably weekly of that work ethic. I want to be like you mm -hmm. moving forward. I wish I would have had it when I was in high school. I wish I would have had your desire and your work ethic and your goals. Um, 
and I, but I can't change that. I can change it now. Exactly. And I, you know, it clicked for me when I was probably 23 and got into sales when I realized like, holy crap, you know, talent does take you so far, but if you have that, if you're willing to pay the price to go along with your talent, that's how you can truly be great. Mm -hmm. So I love that you said that, man, because you're, you're a testimony to paying the price because I mean, your story is just so cool of, you know, I know you don't like to talk about it. And I know you don't like to share it, but I'm so thankful that you are because it's so powerful for these kids out there who are trying to do something in your life. Mm -hmm. Like what he just said can change your life. If you'll show up and pay the price, if you'll show up and and it's not just showing up, like you said, if you'll show up with a, 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 a goal in mind and get after it every single day, eventually you're going to start to see the fruits of your labor. Eventually you're going to start to find that success and you're going to figure out, where in your life it's going to take you. Yeah. You know, you never, you probably never dreamed that football, that now you'd be selling a financial product, that working mm-hmm. in an ETF. You, know, you probably never dreamed that. I, I'll say that, that was truly, I feel like God's plan. Um, I, I, when I, I, all I ever wanted to do was coach football. Yeah. So all I ever wanted to do um, in the back of my mind, I, I hope that that could be a potential reality in the future someday. <laughs> Still there. Um, but that, that's all I ever wanted to do. So I, I literally, I prepared myself to do that. Yeah. Um, and, but it just truly, it wasn't a part of God's plan because there were so many opportunities that just didn't make sense when they didn't work out. Yeah. Uh, things that were no brainers as I was trying to move up and like would have thought were no brainers, but God didn't open those doors. And he, I think about this, you know, if God doesn't build a house, the laborers labor in vain. Um, you know, and I think that's so true. You can go work as hard as you want to doing your own thing, but if it's not a part of God's plan and it's not in His will, I, I think that it's going to drastically limit the success yeah. that you can have. Agreed. Um, and, you know, for me, that the transition was, was hard because part of it, when I first got out of coaching, I, 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 you know, it's kind of like I went to close the door on coaching, but I, 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 I still wouldn't let go of the handle. Yeah. So it's like I'm closing my, my arm in the door here. You yeah. know? So like, how am I going to move on to do something different if I won't let go? Mm-hmm. Um, and then as we transition, um, and, you know, to, to, the, to the place where we are now, it's, it's, it's truly the point where you know, God says he'll do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can hope or ask. And I think so many times people want to go out and do their own thing and, and do what they want to do, but... You know, pretty specific in Proverbs, Proverbs 3, it says, if in all your ways you acknowledge God, he'll direct your path. That's right. I kept fighting it. Yeah. I kept wanting to do my thing, but it, it, it finally took me kind of throwing up my hands and saying, God, what I want to do is apparently what you want me to do. Yeah. So what do you want me to do? And then that's where the doors just started opening. I went, so I, what I'm technically right now, my role, I'm a, uh, a financial wholesaler. So I, I work on the back end with financial advisors, uh, basically as a consultant for them to invest um, and allocate their clients' money. I had no training in that at all, <laughs> at all. But where the opportunity came, I had all the securities license that's required to have that job because I was working in the insurance industry uh, and trying to go. I had somebody call and ask me if I'd be interested and working with a company that was based out of Chicago previously. And I talked to him, found it, took that job. Um, and that job went extremely well, but what was I doing in that role? I was um, I was the top of the leaderboard from an activity standpoint. Because for, for me, coming from athletics, if, if we're gonna have a leaderboard, if we're gonna track this stuff, if there's something yeah. that we're measuring, I'm gonna make sure I'm at or near the top, if we're gonna measure something. and it, Something I, you know, and this is, um, this, I don't know if it comes from Nick Saban, but every coach I ever worked with that was a defensive coordinator previously with Nick Saban, they would always talk about you are what you measure. As an organization, you are what you measure. You get what you measure. You get what you incentivize. So if we're going to measure activity, and that's something important. Well, I'm going to make sure my activity is as good as anybody's. Yeah. 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 And the specific activity it takes. Mm-hmm. When my first boss is uh, Mark Sanders was his name. And uh, I worked with him at State Farm. 
And before I, I didn't even really need the information, but he would dish it all out to me at the time. He would tell me, you know, I always try to hire people that played sports because they're more disciplined. They, tr they know what it's like to work on a team. They, he gave me like four reasons and it's still true to this day. We have, you know, we got five, an office full of them yeah. that uh, have played sports and it, it's definitely true with their mindset. Mm -hmm. It's fire. And that, you know, the way you answered that was so cool because what I love about your life is every, no matter whether it's football, whether it's coaching, whether it's whatever it is, the cream rises to the top. You know what I mean? Like the work ethic, the little things do, that was the, being at the top of the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. The, what I want our audience to realize is that whatever phase of your life is, like whether you're in high school at this point, if you can develop these habits mm -hmm. of really, you know, putting your best effort forward, it's going to pay you well for your life, whether you're playing sports now, because, you know, he just told us how it went from the sports world to the business world. Go ahead and figure out that work ethic piece. Mm -hmm. Like, go ahead and get that part figured out. I wish I would have figured it out earlier. It took me a little bit longer. And, and the thing I'll say kind of on top of, of that, just and it's not necessarily meant to backtrack, but it's going to be really uncomfortable at first. Yes. Yeah. And you're going to think, <clears throat> wow, this isn't working. I made a bad choice. This isn't wrong because like, as you kind of go through the process, you start to have success. You start to be consistent. And if you're not consistent, your success is going to be all like your successes and failures are going to be basically intertwined. all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be much more uncomfortable at first. And then you just get used to doing it. That becomes your routine. That mm -hmm. becomes your habits. That becomes your rituals. But for me, that transition out of coaching to the business world was incredibly painful at first because I didn't have the belief yet. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I, 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 I was hoping for something, but I didn't have the actual belief that it was going to happen. Um, you know, and I say um, the whole time that I was going through the process, you know, in my sports career, I, I believed the whole time that I belonged at Georgia. Yeah. Just, throughout that whole process. When I initially got out of coaching, I, I didn't necessarily believe, I didn't believe myself. So if you're gonna be believed by somebody else, you have to first believe in yourself. Yeah. So that's just from a credibility standpoint there. Um, and it took me kind of going through the process and building up my belief. And that truly came from the work. And so just kind of getting back to that. The more activity that you have, the more opportunities that you go and help other people, mm -hmm. you know, I've, sometimes I kind of feel bad for the first people I ever called on <laughs> because they didn't get the best version of me. Yeah. And, and the best version of me is still out in the future somewhere that I'm trying to achieve and strive for. But I feel like I'm leaps and bounds uh, oh, yeah. ahead of where I was, you know, four or five years ago when I first got out of coaching as I transitioned into the world that I am now. And I think about, you know, this kind of goes back to the homework standpoint and doing my homework, being prepared before I go to a meeting and things like that, not just showing up. Yeah. Because if you just show up, you'll get one meeting. Yeah. You show up. Oh, yeah. Brent's a nice guy. You know, I, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, if I see him, I'll, I'll say, hey, you'll get one meeting. But if you add value, you get invited back. Exactly. That's good. And so that's where that comes into play. So you can't just show up. You got to show up prepared, ready, ready to work, ready to add value for somebody. That's it. And I want to ask, you know, we go from walk-on to SEC coach to, you know, how many times? You probably won the SEC three or four times in those years. So we won four division championships, and then we won the SEC championship once. Okay, so uh, you go there. We, we got to, yeah, we got to go a couple times. To, yeah. To the runner-up in the national, man. National mm -hmm. championship. Runner-up in the national championship game. Uh, that's not even fun to say. Um, <laughs> and then you go into business, but, like, you know, there's these things you're saying that, I mean, he is dropping absolute so many good things. And I want to ask, you know, the transition to, to businessman now to like whatever you call it, mm -hmm. uh, in your world, you know, to employee, to businessman, to, uh, to successful leader within the organization, like what qualities, you know, there's leadership, there's coaching, there's mentor, mm -hmm. like, and then there's doing these little things, these disciplines that you found along the way, how much of that translates into 
what you do now and is it is it everything or is it just certain things that you picked up from that you know do you automatically see yourself mentoring others or are you just mentoring the financial advisors that you mm -hmm. work with because of the success that you had coaching and, and playing yeah um so basically i kind of think about like almost like a franchisee if you will okay i i my territory i cover the state of georgia and so from that standpoint i i think like i'm, I'm trying to grow my assets under management for georgia just like a financial advisor would or uh, an insurance agent would try to grow their book of business sure if you will so that that's kind of like the world so I, in some ways i'm probably more like an entrepreneur than an entrepreneur if you yes, will like i work in i work inside yeah. of an organization but i try to take an entrepreneur mindset as a part of that well the really cool thing about the way our structure at our firm we um, we have different divisions and the leadership within our divisions basically build them out like a team. Okay. So it gives me an opportunity. A lot of our guys are younger guys. Some of these guys, maybe two or three years out of college. So that gives me a direct opportunity to mentor them and help them grow, which like, I'm just like, they're just naturally drawn to that. Yeah. yeah just of helping people. And some of the things I get most excited about in, in my role now is with new, new or young advisors being able to help them grow their business because they're just getting started. They, you know, a lot of times you know, the expression drinking from a fire hose, there's so many things that they're trying to get to understand, learn the industry, learn how to relate to clients, um, trying to figure out a way to set themselves apart. So being able to partner with them and help them grow and, and, and do their job. Well, yes. those are, those are just areas for me personally that I get so much satisfaction. Yes. From. And we do, um, we get to do the exact same thing. And I can, I can attest to that. One thing you just said, cause we've talked about it before, but the entrepreneur thing, there's so many people you talk to that think they're just, they feel like they're a loser cause they work in an organization, but like, you're just another person that's talking that's saying, I work in an organization and mm -hmm. I'm drawing success to myself. Yeah. yeah. So well, you can be a cog in the wheel, you know, or you can actually be somebody that's adding value to the organization. The value um, add is so critical mm -hmm. in everything. And, 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 you know, I think of it this way. Um, and again, this is biblical and I, I, I can't quote the verse exactly. But if you're going to if you're going to get paid an honest age wage, you need to do an honest day's work. Uh, you know, but it, you know, if you're clipping that, and, and yeah, that's you, so good. If you want to be more than just a cog in a wheel, you can't just, again, show up. You actually have to go above and beyond the way I think about it. Uh, my ultimate goal in our organization is I want to grow and, 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 and move up in our organization. If I'm going to do that, it's going to require me to put in the work on the front end. Now, like if you want to, if you want a better job, go ahead and start doing the job you want. Pay that now, price. Absolutely. Pay the price along the way. So go ahead and start doing that now. And then once they realize, you know, the value that you've added, you know, and you can really go make the statement to your boss. If you, if you have a boss, uh, you say, look, this is what I've been doing. You know, you, you can make a case. But if you just go ask your boss for a raise, they're, they're going to ask you, why do you deserve a raise? But if you can go say, hey, I've been doing this. This is how I've been helping these people. These are some responsibilities I've, I've taken on. You know, you know, I've really gone above and beyond. Now you've kind of made your case yourself. And a lot of times you can ask the question, you know, uh, and, and, and position it that way. You know, That's good stuff, but, man. That's good stuff. Absolutely. Well, um, it's been amazing. Uh, there's so many good, I knew it would be good because I've known <laughs> you my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. So I knew that you would bring heat and uh, I'm just so thankful for you sharing your story because mm -hmm. every time I hear it, it inspires yeah. me, man. And, and, it, yeah. and it's not my story. I mean, like th those are just lessons to take away from what I've experienced. I, I, you mentioned earlier, I don't like telling my story. I don't want anything to be about me. I know, and I, I love that. I, want, I love that. You know, I, I, I truly, I love to see people grow and, and, and experience, uh, you know, and just growth and, and positivity and things of that nature. Um, so don't think about, like, my story, Brandon played at Georgia. That's not where the value comes from. Right. It's, it's truly the, the lessons from that experience. Because, I mean, if I would have just stayed at West Georgia and, I, and, and, and never been able to go play at Georgia, but would have had some of the other experiences, would, would there not be still lessons in that? So Absolutely. We, you know, so it's, it's truly, you know, and the way I always think about it, if I hear, if I listen to a lot of podcasts, there's always like one thing that really kind of hits and resonates with me. So if there's anything like that, you know, with this, if it's like you're able to make one positive impact for somebody like that, that's, you know, that's where I appreciate y'all giving me an opportunity to share. Absolutely. And like you said, the, it's the, it's the more actions 
-hmm. equivalent to the more lessons you get to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but we appreciate you making the drive out here. Absolutely. Guys. And to go back to what I was saying, uh, another huge lesson about what he just said is humility. Humility, because he doesn't want it to be about him. It, that's humility, and that's beautiful, because some people would get up here and say all the great things I did, but I just love the the humility that you just showed in that. And and that's why you're so powerful in what you do, man, and that's why this message is going to resonate with so many people, and that's why I love humility, and that's something I'm striving for. So I appreciate everything you do, man. God gives grace to the humble. That's right. But he resists the proud. That's exactly mm. right. Yeah. What a good way to end. God. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you, man. We appreciate you. Yep. Thank you, buddy.